Uh, yeah, so I'm Ohad Barta and I'll talk about the rise of L to native uh, dApps. Um, but before I discuss um, what is L to native dApps, uh, in my opinion, and why I expect them to rise, let's take a step back and analyze the blockchain situation. So Bitcoin was launched in the 2008 and Ethereum 2015 with the promise of offering trustless and like an uh, alternative economy. But in practice, we are like uh, more than a decade after we see that the TPS is like creepingly low, right? We can't compete uh, with banks, credit cards, etc. And why is it? Is it inherent? So in the old days of uh, the traditional economy, we had trusted parties, right? Like banks, like lawyers, like uh, other types of professional. And we basically delegated all the accountability to them. Uh, and they did the execution and they ran the ecosystem and we believed them. And then, the blockchain came and say, okay, we want to verify. We don't want to trust anyone, and we want to have inclusive accountability. But in this process, we lost two very important aspects that since then we are struggling to recover. Uh, the first one is privacy, right? Because if anyone needs to verify a transaction, it natively means they need to also know what the transactions are and what you did. But the more crippling issue and the, focus, the single focus on in this talk is we sacrifice scalability. Um, we just see it in practice, right? Ethereum and Bitcoin TPS is like fractions uh, of what the traditional economy can take. Um, and this is because you have a lot of nodes, right? That run a lot of transactions. They need to verify everything. So is this inherent? Can we not break from this dichotomy where we need to choose between trusting someone and having a very slow economy? So let's see first a bad solution for this uh, breaking from the dichotomy and then a better solution. So a, a, a not very good solution would be to just say, okay, we, we had some gas limit in each block, right? Why not waking tomorrow and say now Ethereum has 150 million gas or 1000 gas per block, right? Ethereum would work just the same. It would have 100 times the TPS and then we wouldn't need this great conference. So wh why is this a bad solution? Because if we say, okay, now verifiers need to keep up, right? They need to run 100 times the, the volume. In practice, less and less verifiers would do so, right? Less and less verifiers would have this big computer in order to track uh, what's being done. So th this is the reason why practically any L1 is stuck in this trade-off, right? The more scale it wants to have, the more transaction it wants to have, the less computers would keep track on what's going on. So L1, like having another L1, you, you are stuck in this paradigm, but what happens when you have layer twos? So now let's introduce proofs. I know this is one of the first conferences of the lecture, so I'll get into what the proof is, and I'll save some time for Alex and the rest of the folks later. Um, so I first stumbled across this beautiful notion of proofs like a decade ago. I worked with Professor Ali Ben Sasson, one of the co-founders of Starkware, in developing one of the first proof systems. And we actually see the wrong way of doing proofs in our day-to-day -day lives, right? If you go to the grocery store, buy some items, it gives you a receipt, and this receipt is a proof, right? It contains all the items that you bought with their prices, and it has like, okay, you need to pay 89.50 bucks because those are all the items you bought, and this is their sum. And in order to verify the grocery store, you have to repeat the calculation, right? Which is how, like you can make the equivalence between repeating the calculation here and verifying transaction on L1, right? This is basically the same process. But with um, validity proofs or Stark proofs in the uh, case of Starkware, uh, you can potentially gain two very important things. One is privacy, and um, so, you to verify some, that something happened doesn't need to do anything beyond verifying the proof. You don't need to know the transaction's details. And the other one, which is first already in production and secondly proved to be much more crucial for the day-to-day -day use cases, is scalability, right? If you can verify the proof was done in like negligible amount of work, um, you save yourself a lot of time. And it's very easy to see that um, applying uh, validity proofs to the dichotomy we saw earlier actually solves the problem, right? Because now we have all of those people that want to verify the calculations, but if they get proofs, they don't need to repeat the calculations. It's enough to have 
one big uh, machine, right? That is um, doing all the computation and then submit um, zero knowledge proof to a lot of verifiers that verify it. Obviously, like we said in the panel before, we'll have several such machines in like one year from now, but for now it's one machine. So this was like um, an introduction to what is like a validity roll-up and why I think that this is the actually only way to break from the dichotomy between like the trade-off between uh, security and decentralization. Um, but why do you as a um, decentralized application developer need to care much about are you working on L1 or on a validity rollup? So the sad truth that I'm going to try to convince you now is that when you come to develop a decentralized application, you have to mind what platform you're operating on. And you have to very carefully mind the constraints uh, that it uh, brings on your application, right? Uh, a lot of times you'd like to do many great things on Ethereum, but it would cost like one million gas. And one million gas is just not feasible for transactions that you expect to happen every second. So you need to settle and say, okay, I'll bunch transactions, I'll make my logic simpler. Um, let's see some, use, some, real use, uh, some real examples to this. So first of all, AMMs, right? We will all love to have a fully decentralized order book exchange, right? When anyone can publish order, cancel order, have many order types. Um, but in reality, on Ethereum, we typically have AMMs, right? Which are low gas approximation for the same logic. It's really impressive to see how they manage to do things with like less and less gas. But if you are operating on a system where gas consumption is less of a concern, then you can suddenly have much more economically efficient system. Another examples come from the lending and borrowing platform, right? Um, if you have, for example, very, very cheap liquidations, then you can uh, give more leverage to your users, right? Because there is less fee going from that. If you have uh, easy integration and cheap integration with many collaterals, uh, you can have more coin times in your liquidation system. So this is like just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and the, the, you can see that whatever we see on Ethereum and all the terrific things that happen, they happen while all the developers need to be under this very, very low game glass ceiling. So when we move to validity rollups, and um, specifically I'll focus on Cairo, uh, but in, in general, the, the, and StarkNet, but in general, the, the validity rollup architecture, it has two very, very things, uh, important things that are prohibitively expensive on L1 and are free on a validity rollup. So first is computation, right? We see that the cost of computation is negligibly small, right? Because in the end, L1 needs to only verify this computation. It doesn't need to to invest any, line, any resource which is linearly correlated with it. So you can do double, triple, 100 times more the computation with basically almost the same cost. And the other thing, uh, which here you can have somewhat of a difference between validity rollups and optimistic rollups, is that you don't care what is the length of the parameters functions get. Because in the end of the day, everything is mathematically enforced to be correct on L1, assuming we audit things carefully etc. But assuming the prover and verifier stack works correctly, L1 doesn't have to know all of the transactions. Imagine, for example, Oracle price update, right? You get 20 price updates from 20 uh, entities. Each one comes with a signature. Each one comes with a timestamp. Very complex logic with like maybe kilobytes of input. But in the end, you change just one state cell, right? You say, okay, the new price of Bitcoin is 30,000. So you have here a transaction that would be very, very expensive on L1 and maybe somewhat expensive uh, with optimistic rollups, but actually validity rollups are specifically tailored to handle such kind of, of events, right? Um, notice that it's not like a magic box that makes everything cheap. If you store stuff on the rollup, it would still cost you something, right? We don't want um, like 100 uh, petabytes uh, state for rollups. So it's not like we remove all constraints across the board, but those are very, very crucial constraints that are now lifted with validity rollups. Okay, so I talked a lot in the air, but let's see a, comp a, a first example to how moving to validity rollups can change application lives. Some of you may guess, yes, I'm going to talk about DYDX, sorry. So uh, before coming to, to us, DYDX has a perpetual trading system, right? It worked on L1 
It offered single asset positions with Bitcoin and Ethereum. It has 10 times leverage and the cost of transaction was around 120K gas. After uh, we rebuilt together with, with them the system on StarkX like as a validity rollup, we got a self custodian perpetual trading on L2, which had um, much uh, higher leverage, right? 25 versus 10. Um, and cost of transaction is 500 gas. But crucial notice that before that, before um, being on a validity rollup, users could be say, okay, I bet on Bitcoin or it, short on, or long, and that's it. Now, if you go to DYDX, you can bet on like 20 types of uh, assets in parallel with the same collateral, right? It's much more economically efficient. So notice that the first two advantages here, they seem unrelated, right? So, okay, we move to validity rollup. Sure, you save some factor of gas cost, but what are the, all of those other advantages have to do with it? So first of all, with regarding the leverage, right? We, you have much more frequent Oracle updates, right? So we can update the prices multiple times per minute and not once per hour like on L1. So now uh, application designers can say, okay, I can have much more reliable liquidation mechanism. I can offer much more leverage with taking only a fraction of the risk. And if I look on the other benefit of having cross margin capability, sure, right, you could write it in solidity. You could have um, stuff in solidity that says, okay, I'll let positions of a user have like 20 assets. It, it's, it's very easy to do so, actually, but the gas cost, oh, the gas cost is horrible, right? It would move the, the cost from like 120K gas to more than 300K gas if you assume that uh, positions have many assets in them. So, yeah, it's, it's a great addition, but is it worthwhile to multiply by a factor of two or three the transaction cost on every trade? Probably not. So you can see that whenever you move to L2, the entire landscape of you know, the application changes. And actually, okay, DYDX are deployed on StarkX, but if I want to refer to a general purpose um, environment that would offer anyone to write the exact logic that they want, I have to discuss StarkNet. So StarkNet is to be decentralized, as we've seen, um, to be much, much sooner permissionless, uh, means that anyone could deploy or uh, send transactions to the network. A uh, stark powered uh, validity rollup with general computation. It is based on the Cairo uh, language, uh, which as many uh, developers uh, and much less tiers proved is not that hard to learn. And it's basically the same validity ro rollup architecture, right? We'll have permissionless users um, sending transactions to sequencers. Everything is run on L2. And um, in the end, only the proof arrives to L1. So just to give you a bit of sense of uh, the StarkNet roadmap, we started a year and a half ago to develop it internally, and less than a year ago we released it to testnet. Since then, we are gradually continuing to roll out. We are still in alpha. Uh, first funds would come to StarkNet mainnet only next week when we'll first deploy bridges. And we focus on improving the performance of the network, gaining more soundness, more stability, and next year, hopefully, uh, to be decentralized. And what's amazed me is that in the less than a year since we deployed to, start, to testnet, I see all of those use cases that I never imagined before would be relevant to blockchains um, gaining life on StarkNet. Let, let's take a few more examples. So blockchain games. Uh, before it, you had to settle and store the assets on L1, right, with NFTs. But all the, on the logic of the game itself would be off-chain, right? This would be a necessity. You can't have a game where you need to wait like 20 seconds and pay a lot of dollars for one move. It's, it doesn't work. But if you have a very scaled environment, suddenly you can say, okay, obviously some games would be too hard to, to run on blockchains, but if you have um, simple games and everything, the line of simple grows higher and higher. We've seen simple uh, graphic engines even, or two body simulation running on top of StarkNet. Then you could do a trustless logic or somewhat trustless logic, and users wouldn't have to care about like hacks uh, in their games, which is a great offering. Another example, uh, uh, okay, I'm very um, eager to get to other examples, but we actually have gaming that are like um, well developed on StarkNet testnet. Uh, we have, for example, Game of Life, uh, which is relatively simple, right? You have Influence, which is a, mid, a bit more complex games. So those are examples to games that include some of their uh, off-chain logic on StarkNet as well. 
Um, another example is the generative art font, right? You have, for example, a um, way to say, okay, this NFT is not some random picture. It's a process of a very carefully crafted mathematical process with like 10,000 iterations. So if you now do issue such NFT on L1, you have to do your off-chain, like the, the tens of thousands of iterations off-chain, right? And then you just issue the NFT in the end. But when the computation becomes much, much uh, cheaper, you can do everything on top of, uh, of the blockchain and get much more trust, right? And offer much more unique value propositions for your users. Um, and another area is things that weren't even before on L1 at all, right? L1 is more, mostly focused on like um, DeFi and gaming, but suddenly on StarkNet, it's feasible to have a project like Snapshot X, right? Snapshot X is a great product we build with, with Snapshot. And it would basically offer any DAO to have their voting systems on top of StarkNet with arbitrarily complex logic, so potentially much more complex logic than what's being done on L1 today, with the same security assumptions as L1, because in the end of the day, everything uh, would be echoed to L1 and verified by L1 nodes. Um, okay, so we've seen that a lot of applications could fit in StarkNet. And right now, the most skeptical of you might think that I'm a cheater. And why am I a cheater? Because in the end, StarkNet is a blockchain, right? And, and it has some physical limitations. We would potentially not arrive to like 100K TPS on StarkNet, right? I don't think any blockchain would. So how can it be? Like maybe it's possible, you could say, okay, so each one of those use cases could fit into StarkNet, right? It'd be like 100, 1,000 more scalable than Ethereum. But maybe if we take like 100 such applications, suddenly we'll have like a, no a noisy neighbors problem, right? Suddenly the, the network would become congested. So how can we avoid that? How can we say, okay, you can keep coming and coming to this ecosystem and it would contain you all. So sadly, we are not magicians yet in Starkware. We are working on it. But the good news is that a validity proof magic can be used once again. So what can you do when StarkNet room isn't enough on your validity rollup? You can say, okay, we have L3s, right? What are L3s? It's an execution environment that is run by some computers and then it's proven to L2, right? So you can have, if it sounds familiar, it's because exactly the relation between L2 and L1, right? So when L2 would become too crowded, some applications would naturally opt out to say, okay, we want to have L3s with the same security assumptions, right? All of those ecosystem is in the end echoed to some proof that is verified on L1. So you can be even on L100, you don't lose anything, right? You don't have bridges with like multi-sig, everything is still echoed to L1 and everything can live together with like uh, messaging systems between uh, those trees. So this way we can like scale almost indefinitely, right? And contain more and more applications and more and more use cases. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to see what's going to happen in this space. We've already seen projects from all of those areas uh, that are uh, going live on, on StarkNet testnet to some degree. Uh, some of them uh, you can recognize, okay, they took some code from Ethereum and they rebuilt it. But for other ones, like, uh, I don't know, vo like complex voting systems, it's something that partially was abandoned by, uh, by Ethereum. Most communities doesn't use it anymore. And even the ones they do, they have to do a lot of sacrifices to make the voting system work and be as, as cheap as possible, or like Web3 citizenship. So we see a lot of use cases uh, for projects that weren't there before. Um, and you determine what's next, right? What can you build with scalable general computation? Uh, with a term like architecture, so you have full composability, if you know how smart contracts work, the high-level architecture is intuitive, you don't have to trust anyone, and next year it would be decentralized as well. Uh, this is the first part of the talk. The other part, Louis from Maker should have given, but he is with COVID. So he sent me text on Telegram, which I'll go to now. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So basically I just discussed all the applications that are going to StarkNet. And obviously I, I'm fascinated by a lot of use cases that weren't there before, but it's also important to support a rich DeFi 
and working with leading protocols such as Maker. So uh, in Q3 of last year, we started to work with Maker on importing the Maker protocol uh, into Starknet. Um, we in Stark were really fan what Maker community is doing and, and their algorithm, etc. And they natively want to expand to more and more uh, environments and bring the, their amazing uh, DAI coin to more and more platforms. Um, so they'll actually release uh, the um, uh, simple DAI bridge uh, on April 28, um, which is something that Louis could have told you with looking glass on his phone. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, and this bridge is not just a usual bridge. It has a lot of like maker guarantees. Like it has a sky patch. Uh, if maker thinks that something is wrong with Starknet, um, basically you can be sure that die on Starknet is equivalent to die on Ethereum, uh, because the entire framework was developed and is backed by uh, the maker community. So I think that this is amazing. And the good news is that they're not going to stop there. Uh, they're working on like a wormhole implementation, which is fast bridging first from Starknet to L1, then between several L2 components. Um, and towards the end of the, the year, they'll even have like the MCD. So you will be able to mint new dies based on collateral. And this die you mint in like negligible cost on Starknet will be totally equivalent and indistinguishable from any L1 die, which I think is, is great. Um, so yeah, I think one of the great things to do when you work at Starknet, like of, of Starknet, is to work with these amazing communities and look how we can build together um, just a better future for the blockchain space. Thank you. Very thankful. Maybe one. Okay, maybe we have time for one question. So it's going to be a really good one. Test. Ah, uh, I was wondering uh, on your Starknet, no, Cairo Lang repository, you have kind of an unusual license. And so I was wondering, are you going to change it in the future or is it uh, staying like this? And also, what's the intention behind the current license? Um, I, I wasn't in the rooms with, with, with the lawyers when we decide on the license. Uh, I guess the high-level motivation for the license is to allow you to um, conveniently working with Cairo on Starknet without thinking about implications, as long as you're working on Starknet. Um, it's possible that the license doesn't match that spirit. We can discuss it offline. Um, it's, nothing is set in stone. We want to build it with you.